Hello, Julian. Hello, Mike. Oh, how are you today? I'm fine. I'm all right. Yeah. How about you? I'm good, actually. I've been doing a lot of reflecting on proper CPD today. Have you? Have you? Yeah. Good reflections. I've got a mirror there. Just doing some. Yeah. 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 But not, not just writing down my notes. I've been thinking more about what I've been doing and what yeah. I've learned. Good. Yeah. Good. Yeah. It's, it's all about thinking about what you learned, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. That's why it's called reflection, is it not? Absolutely. It's not about writing notes about what you've done. Yeah. It's about thinking about the impact, isn't it? Yeah. Tonight, I think we've got someone who has a bit of clout with the RCBS. And, uh... I think we do. So, on that note, I'd like to welcome you to episode <laughs> of Veterinary <laughs> Ramblings. Good evening. Hi, I'm Mike Brampton. And my name is Julian Ho. Welcome to Veterinary Ramblings. So who have we got tonight then, Junior? Well, we've got a really interesting guy tonight. So if I tell you a little bit of his bio, because he's not your usual vet. Mm -hmm. So he has been commander of soldiers in a counter-terrorism operation. Wow. He was deployed to Bosnia as part of a peacekeeping force. Mm -hmm. And he was in the human health care delivery and product development in Bosnia. He's also served in the US, Germany, all over the UK, and travelled to five continents in his army career. Wow. He was actually deployed to Sierra Leone to help out with the Ebola pandemic. He was what? also involved in the foot and mouth disease outbreak in 2001. Wow. Not the sort of thing you normally expect from a vet, but he is a great vet as well. So we got him. We got him. And he is Neil Smith. And he's a tremendous guy. Neil Smith, RCVS, Neil Smith. Neil Smith, RCVS, Neil Smith. Okay, well, I think tonight it's going to be really special because mm -hmm. for the first time on Veterinary Ramblings, rather than just having one guest, we're going to have two. <gasps> because joining Neil is a lady who graduated from the RC, RVC in 1992. And after graduation, she spent four years working in Canada, where she also took her American boards and exams over there and got into a lot of native wildlife and exotic work. She's going back to the UK, where she's going to certificate in zoological medicine and her diploma in zoological medicine. And she currently runs a first opinion and referral exotic practice up in the northwest near Merseyside. Her name is Molly Varga Smith. That's Neil Smith and Molly Varga Smith. Indeed it is. And here they are. Neil, it's really good to see you again. Good to see Molly, you. Molly, good to see you. Your role in life as a vet seems to have involved you in more single celled organisms than it has multi celled organisms. <laughs> <laughs> Or is this not correct? <laughs> no, I think anybody can tell stories about, you know, tweaking animal glands and castrating dogs and, uh, and and so on. My career has been eclectic. So I've been part of the healthcare delivery as well. You went to, you were posted to Africa, weren't you, to deal with Ebola outbreak? Yeah, so I went to Sierra Leone in um, 2015. I was there just over four months. Right. <laughs> Gosh. That's what, what, what were your take home memories from that? Because that, that, yeah, there's, there's... It's a really interesting one because bear in mind I did I done foot mouth disease in two thousand and one, so the idea of controlling virus outbreaks was you know, something I had very um, in your face exposure from from both a tactical and a strategic level, and so I was out there. I was sent out there as commander medical, so you know commanding the UK military medical personnel, which involved an Ebola treatment centre, a role to hospital, which was basically a one, one operating um, theatre bed, one intensive care bed, you know, ward of four, plus a very extensive primary care. But we were scaling down at the time, and when we were phasing down the the the, um, the number of medical personnel there, so I got much more involved actually in the whole national sort of fight against Ebola. And I was switching between you know the daily strategic meetings down to actually. 
being out there on the front line. So, you know, we had an issue with um, local community health centers where people were, the average one woman a day was giving birth. Um, we were having, still getting outbreaks down there in the slums of, um, of, of Freetown. And, and we, in one particular bowl of treatment facility, which, um, so to put this way, needed a little bit of help putting back together. It was, uh, it was in a very bad way. There were, and, and so really actually, I was going in there and dealing with issues. It was great making a difference. The things I did will make a difference, save lives. It's a strange play when I talk about it, the Ebola piece being challenging and interesting and challenging were two years that I used a lot. But actually, it was absolutely fascinating. You'd um, go back in a hobby. I would go back in a hobby. I mean, yeah. I, I, I loved Sierra there and I love the people of Sierra Leone. Really, really great, um, great people. And all the different NGOs that were out there that you, you ended up working with who found it very unusual to be working with the military. It's not something they would normally do for very, 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 very good reasons. Um, but in this, because it wasn't a conflict zone, they were okay with them. They also saw the fact that, you know, we were there as the paramilitary wing of DFID. Sorry, if it is Department for International Development. Right. And, and so when you're talking about control of, uh, of Ebola, yeah. Uh, also, the fight against uh, Ebola that 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 was more containment and control of spread, or or, or actual delivery of. Uh... Well, there were two things. One, one, well, it was about continual peace, and it's fascinating to look at the current issues with, with COVID, the psychosocial issues, the, the human behaviour about getting the messages across. There were you talking about uh, people who were predominantly um, Muslim, some Christian, but also um, animalism. They believe in in spirits and pay healers and so on. And you know, that, that is a very strong belief they had. You know, we, we have people who believe you know, COVID is a, is a scam run by Bill Gates and, and et cetera, et cetera. So we, you know, these, these attitudes and opinions exist within populations. And it's a question about how do you address that communication? But one of the key things we did was what do we need to do to stop us needing to go back? What capacity and capability can we build in the country? And MSF actually in their Medicines and Frontier in their annual report had put down that um, from decision to deploy to actually have a tentative facility in country will take 30 days. Now you're talking about a disease that's got around about a 12 to 14 day incubation period. So by the time they would have got that, and it's not reasonable, that's a pretty tight time. So we looked at them and said, well, what can we do? And so we came up with a concept of what I call the rapid deployable isolation and treatment facility. Because yes, these facilities were to treat, but actually the major part was to isolate, was to get the virus out of the village. Yeah. And, and so we created, or well, I was led on creating a basic, but it worked, 48 bed um, facility based on equipment that was already available um, and trained with the um, Sierra Leone Armed Forces who had been running 80 bottle treatment facilities during the outbreak, so they knew what they were doing. Yeah. Again, capability, which was a tented facility, it was what we call mandrolic, it was stored in a secure facility, you threw it into the back of trucks and drove it out and put it up. And we actually were aiming for getting up and running and accepting patients within 72 hours. We actually exercised it and did it in 48 and oh. handed that over. So DFID funded it. Um, the um, Australian Armed Forces ran it. And after I left, it was actually used. There was a minor recrudescence in January 16 up in, up in uh, the northern part of Sierra Leone. And it was deployed. And the, the outbreak stopped. Uh, so it, the concept was absolutely sound. You took the training facility to where the outbreak was. And, and dealt with it. Mm -hmm. Gosh, that's absolutely amazing stuff. I, I interrupted you, Molly. I'm so sorry. You were about to say when I, when I was speaking about control of Ebola. I think the one thing, as an outsider looking into this, um, actually this came about on a training day at another at another arena, really, um, was the fact that the NGOs go in and they say, we need those trees levelling, we need that hill gone, we need blah, blah, blah. And actually the capability to do that is beyond most of them and yet the the interface can be quite rocky between military and the ngos but actually in that kind of situation 
that they are able, particularly in a non-conflict zone, to go in and actually do what needs to be done. It's, it's, it's massively. And I didn't understand that. It's massively really. important that the NGOs don't have anything to do with the military because when they're going into conflict zones, they are not taking sides for their humanitarian reasons. Mm-hmm. And if they're identified as being linked to an opposing force, and that could make them a target. Mm-hmm. And cool. they're completely justified. I remember talking to a young lady who was working for one of the NGOs out there who we were actually in a dark, hot police station in the eastern district of Three Town. And she said, and she'd just come from Afghanistan. And she's you know, amazing people. And she said, it, I wouldn't be talking to you in Afghanistan, but mm-hmm. I can talk to you. I can talk to yeah. you. Here. Yeah. The, there's, there's, still, there's still a sensitivity there. I think there's still an issue that the NGOs can't be seen to be working actively with a military force because they don't know where they're going to be next. Mm. So you, you drew an obvious uh, parallel with uh, with COVID. Um, now, and this is the problem, I think, that uh, that hasn't been fully addressed by the media. So people aren't... We, we, in, in the veterinary world, we talk about fully informed consent uh, and, and information. I think that's been lacking... Uh, in, in terms of the coronavirus pandemic, because it's not a binary virus. It's not a, you're ill, you're okay. No. It, it's yeah. a, a, a gray virus. As you say, it's our body's own immune system that causes the degree of, of infection, or the degree of, of, um, of, of illness in the infection, the, the so-called catecholamine uh, cataclysm that, that, that we see in, in people who, uh, who suffer the most. Um, and that, I don't think enough has been done educating the public on how the virus itself works. Yeah. It's, it's really quick. We haven't responded well. We haven't done it right. If we told people that a secondary effect of, uh, of COVID infection was erectile dysfunction, we'd have put a lot more compliance in it. Uh, <laughs> and this comes back to the behavioural piece. You know, it's people situate things that fits their 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 situation if yeah. if we were in world war ii that the media at that point was far more supportive huh. and solid and everybody actually sort of put stuff aside and thought you know what this is a bit of a a, a big deal and let's work together and at the moment we haven't got that whatsoever Mm-hmm. This is the biggest thing that will happen in most of our lifetimes, and this heaven forbid, we Hopefully. have a world world war. You know, and, and, and once again, we start on coronavirus. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> <laughs> and why not? <laughs> Although I, I think that's most, that's most tennis. Yeah, oh, don't ask about tennis. <laughs> I said no, don't ask about tennis because other than having watched Judy Murray today making shortbread, I know nothing about tennis. So. Oh, oh, but you do know about yoga. A little bit, sometimes, yeah. Ah, I think a little bit more than a little bit, isn't it? Because aren't you a qualified yoga teacher? I am, yeah. Hmm. What got so you I into would that? argue you know a little <laughs> bit more than just a little bit. Yeah, so yeah. what got you into that, Molly? I actually, one of my friends encouraged me to go to a class very locally at local primary school, actually. And I went and the teacher was amazing and I really, really loved it. Nobody else continued going, just me. And eventually that class stopped and I went to a new class and the guy that taught me was attending the new class. And I, you know what, I loved it. I really, when you find something where it resonates, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, and actually I think it, you know, it, in, in a lot of ways that it's quite an intellectual thing to do and there's a lot of challenging thinking associated with it as well as sort of you know making funky shapes and stuff like that so eventually eventually one of my teachers um suggested I did the teacher training so I did the teacher training so I I left a very unhappy job mm-hmm. and and so, um, the next day I went and did, started a 16 month sort of on and off uh, teacher training course. So do you actively teach? I don't at the moment. I used to, um, the most recently, actually teach at work. Right. And I actually 
find that that out of anything that gives me something back is that really and we've got to do it. I'm not allowed to really and I, 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 for various other reasons it's difficult for me to be out late and stuff so but it, it's lovely because actually we've got I work in a big hospital. There are a lot of staff. We've got a lot of branches. And actually to have people that I don't directly usually work with come together and we do something and I hope it gives them something, certainly gives me something back and Mm -hmm. I get to share. And that is what I really love about it. And it's it's a nice thing and it's a positive thing. So, so I, 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 I'm picturing we, we covered we covered in a, in another episode a long time ago about the the shift end debris in an yeah. intensive care unit, and and it makes me want to come up and work in your hospital because I can imagine that your shift end debrief not only involves debriefing on the patients that we've worked with today mm-hmm. and the situations that we've covered, but also uh, moving into a sunburst appreciation yes. or a down dog. And, Definitely some down dog. And, and, and yeah. working, the, working the whole shapes thing into, into the debrief. I think, yeah, I think it's almost allowing your head the space to debrief itself. Right. Mm-hmm. Because actually, you, the, you know, when you get the, sort of the, the background chatter in your head yeah. and the monkey mind and... Everything's going round and round. Actually, you, you're concentrating too much to yeah. do that. And certainly when you're controlling the breath, and the breath will control your heart rate to a degree, mm-hmm. actually it gives you that space to process a little bit. Mm. And, you know, particularly if we had people from surgery and people from other departments, we haven't had the same day. And it's actually, it, it is quite a good thing. And it's it's also, you know, it's fun. I, the classes that I attend, I seriously get heckled quite a lot, really. You know, and it's good because I've known these people a long time. And Heckling in a yoga class? That's outrageous. <laughs> it's fine. It's brilliant. <laughs> but it also... Well, they can't adjust you, can they? They can't adjust me. So, yeah. And so I suppose... Really- that's when one. yoga meets stand-up comedy, it's, uh... <laughs> you should go to the yoga classes. They close you. It's absolutely is that, yeah. Really, really. Yeah. Do you know, I, I do. I do a lot of climbing, <laughs> and I think the same thing happens if you're focused on something enough. Yeah. Then you can't help but but disperse the uh, the other thoughts of the day. Absolutely, and whatever gets you to to that point. So it might be walking or hiking or running. Or whatever it is, you know, and I, I think it's it's a positive. Mm. But I think you back and you know count. having that community thing is a good thing. D- d- does this count? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, that's all right. Then. That's that's a good excuse. <laughs> We've got our excuses for drinking our gin, Julian. <laughs> it, it takes mm-hmm. us to that point. Mm-hmm. And I'm asking, I don't run because I find that if I do run, then I spill this. Yeah. So. Uh, you need one of those handy backpacks with the straw. Oh, is that what you use, Molly? Yeah, yeah always. The camelback, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, camelback. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I do remember one, um, one, one summer going on a walk with a vet friend of mine, and we had a camelback full of rum and coke. And um, <laughs> I don't think I've ever been so dehydrated in my life walking around the Brecon Beacon. <laughs> that, that, wouldn't, that wouldn't have ended well. Enough. No, it didn't. It didn't. <laughs> like a good idea at the time. You know, we were, we were the lads out for a walk. Mm. Than me. I seem to remember something similar on my Duke of Edinburgh's walk, actually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or, or semi-remember something like that. Yeah. Do you do you miss the army, Neil? Do you know what? That's a really that is a very interesting question. Is um, no, um, I you know I did thirty years. Was a regular, and then another nine months keeping on the chief vet job until the right person was in place to replace me as a reservist. And it was a way of life, but my career has been so eclectic that it's not been that sort of you know regimented 
way of life you know, without mm. without sort of um, putting any puns in there. So, and I, you know, we change jobs every two or three years, and you know, some which have been you know in a unit in command as soldiers, some of which have been flying in Eskimo in a suit, um, some of which have been you know working very closely more with civilians than with military, and it was time for a, it was time for a change for a number of. A number of a number of good reasons, and you know, it's thirty years. I think is um, is a decent amount of time um, to give to it. And I've done everything that either I wanted to do or was going to be able to do. Some some twice, and we had the centenary of the the Royal Britain Corps getting its royal prefix in twenty eighteen, mm-hmm. and there were a lot of events around that, in, in, including an amazing dinner with um, with our Colonel and Chief Princess. The Princess Royal in St James's Palace. Uh, we had um, a parade. Now we'd had a, par- a parade through Melton a few years earlier, and on that occasion, I, I was the one on the dais, and all these guys here on horseback or with dogs marked past me, and it was absolutely great. And all I had to do was lift my arm and salute as they came mm-hmm. past. When it mm-hmm. came to this one, because of the importance of it, more important people wanted to be on the dais. So I was told, well, "Sir, you're, you're going to be leading the parade. That's great." Yet yeah, mounted. Now I used to ride a lot as a teenager, <laughs> um, but I haven't actually oh. ridden a horse for twenty-eight years. Yes, you had because we went well, pony, trekking pony, trekking Wales, yeah. trekking. <laughs> pony trekking in Wales. <laughs> yeah, I had a horse that, that always wanted to be right up the horse in front of anybody came close behind, kicked out. But mm. and I didn't fall off. But other than that one sort of hour and a half, I hadn't been on a horse for twenty-eight years. And so they did a bit of a risk assessment on me and, and put me on a horse and said, yeah, you seem to be able to not fall off um, too easily. And then I, we, we did the training and it was basically two or three days and then the actual parade. And mm-hmm. I was given a um, household cavalry charger who'd just come off public duties, you know, just done, you know, Harry made a wedding and all that sort of stuff, came up to Melton. Of course, when these horses come to Melton, they're coming up for a bit of an R&R and they expect to go out in the field. Mm-hmm. And an empress ended up in a stable with somebody who was no longer that familiar with being with horses. And um, she was um, a little bit of a challenge. Um, <laughs> and we did, we, did a rehe- we did a proper rehearsal at um, five o'clock in the morning, two days before. And that went quite well uh, because there was no around and there was no band and, uh, and so forth. And so we thought, well, that's good. And then we came down to do the actual the actual piece. And bearing in mind, when you're doing ceremonials, you're not wearing a, 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 a head head protection. You just got your ordinary hat on. Sure. You're not a protector. Um, you've got a double rein, which you're holding in one hand because your other hand has a sword in it. Um, you don't want to fall off, do you? It would make uh, Roy Kinnear's accident seem like. Uh... <laughs> yeah. So we started we started down in the um, in the central mountain. There were several thousand people there, and there were. Cheering, and some bloke appeared wearing a tamashanta, waving red buckets about trying to raise money for something. I'm not quite sure what, right under my horse's nose. <laughs> and then the band was there playing, and the band was marching quite slowly. And my horse wanted to go a bit faster. This was the most collected canter you have ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> but you know that euphemism of the, you know, of, the, of, the, of the duck or the swan looking serene on the centre, but paddling away underneath. Um, so it was like hitting a bobsleigh run, actually. And, um, um, but success was there because I didn't quite trample on anybody. I didn't mm-hmm. fall. And I didn't skewer anybody by my sword um, disappearing out. And I, and I did, you know, I, the general salute, which you do with you know, shouting and waving your sword around. Brilliant. And you didn't take your eyebrows off as you raised your... your or knock the hat off or, or anything like that. Yeah. It went by, it, it, from the outside looking in, it as looked, I said, it looks fine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was a greater appearance of control than they actually were being genuine. So, uh, so I, I had the privilege um, in the middle of COVID, in fact, the, the only um, passing out parade to be held, or proper passing out parade in, in front of public invited guests um, to see uh, Middleson. Um, What's the, what's the expression? Is it graduate or, or be commissioned at Sandhurst? It's commissioned well, it's sovereign, parade. Sovereign's parade. So. Sovereign's parade, that's right. And um, 
So you, you're going to tell me that you've not, at the end of that parade, the, the sort of the highlight for a lot of the people is that, and I, again, forgive me for not knowing the, the rank, but there is a senior officer in attendance on a horse. And at the end of the Sovereign's Parade, you can tell me who it is, and I mean, put, me, put me straight on the, on the technical aspects of it. Um, but the highlight in the end of the parade, after all of the new officers have filed back in through the, the main college doors at Sandhurst, um, the chap on the horse rides said horse up the steps and through the college gate into the centre of the college on the horse. So have, have you done that? I haven't done that. So that's the job. It's actually not a senior officer. It's quite a junior officer. It's the old college adjutant. Oh, so right. it's normally a captain. Right. And, um, yeah, no, it's a grey that they do it on. Yeah. We'll always agree. Hmm. Yeah. yeah. And no, that's that's part of what they do. And the horse is trained, trained to do it. I'm not quite sure where it, where it turns once it gets inside. Um, Sorry, I should but, just say... Neil, sorry for interrupting you, but a lot of our listeners are American and they, they may not understand what a grey is. But uh, in England, we have a nomenclature for our horses that's about as simple as the cricket rules. Um, <laughs> the, the, the shorter version is there are no white horses. No white horses exist. Any white horse is grey. So mm. a grey is actually in America a white horse. We don't have bays anymore, that we're actually allowed to call them brown. Uh, Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we call them brown now, not bays. But, um, yeah. yeah. There we go. So, uh, and we'll explain cricket later. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that'd be a good trick question, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. What colour is this horse? Let's, let's go from horses, which are a non-standard animal, as far as I'm concerned. I, I do dogs and cats. But Molly, you do even more non-standard animals, don't you? Yeah, I don't do dogs and cats. No. In fact, we do it, yeah. So, yeah, I do everything else that you can get through a door legally. <laughs> so it's a broad church, really. Yes. You, you went to Canada, didn't you, to, to, to start your exotic animal training? Yeah, well, I, I was at that point married to a Canadian, and so we lived in Canada for four years. So I did the NAVLI, the... the fabled North American veterinary exams, including mm. the practical exam. And are they as grueling as they're supposed to be? They are. They are, actually. It's, it was very good because when you graduate in the UK, you've had a really good education. When you graduate in Canada or the US, you can certainly place a capita and do a lot of the practical stuff that you haven't had the education we've had. It was really, really useful for me to go back and switch a little bit up how I thought about things. And it was actually, if you had the opportunity after you graduate to revise for a year, why wouldn't you? And there are there are waiting lists to do the exams. So I went through the waiting list. I started and didn't finish a master's degree. And I did a lot of work experience, a lot of work experience. Mm -hmm. So I was very lucky. And I was very lucky when I started working to remain employed at a point where 25% of vets didn't get jobs. Wow. Was that right? It was, this was at the beginning of why Canada really started um, with, you know, the, the very strict financial measures to get itself out of recession. And so the, the amount of unemployment was ridiculous. You know, I couldn't get a job in a donut store. Really? You know, really, yeah. Did you try? Yes, I did. I like a donut, to be fair. You, you're you're uh, referring here to Timmy Hortons, I presume? I'm referring to Timmy's, yeah, definitely. But any of any other Canadian donut outlet... You know, yes, yes. Other, other Canadian donut and coffee outlets are available. I had a lovely skiing holiday in Whistler once, and uh, I just remember having beaver tails there. Ew, yeah. The subject of my master's was actually beavers and uh, beaver parasites. Well, the, is it, the beaver tails are, are waffles, aren't they? They're, uh... They are, but actually, oh. if, if you're Native American or First Nation person, the real literal beaver tails are a delicacy. Are they? Mm. Yeah. But the beavers would find it very difficult to swim afterwards, wouldn't they? Yeah. I'm not convinced they survive. What do you do with the rest of the yeah. beaver? Yeah. Well, you, you, you divide it up. It's, it's a bit like um, it's a bit like some places they'll eat the, the heads off the fish. 
Um, yeah. Whereas spoilt, spoilt white Westerners wouldn't even think about doing that. Mm. We'll, have the, we'll have the fillet and we'll leave the rest. Mm. Well, years ago, I was on a NATO exercise in the southeastern Turkey right. um, doing meat inspection for, for, for the, because um, we were buying fresh meat. And the sheep they had down there, which we were buying, actually had um, very bizarre, I can't remember what the breed it was, but it had a tail that had a, basically a ball of fat at the top of the tail. Right. Mm. And um, highly sought after delicacy on I Well, I was looking at this and thinking I couldn't really. Um, See what our um, what our army chefs were going to do. Who were going to do with this? And because it is, yeah, because of delicacy, they actually allowed us to buy them without the tail. I thought we were doing a good deal there because we were actually getting we were buying meat rather than fat with a with a tail for it. Yeah, and they were happy because they suddenly had this additional supply of fat with a tail for it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I've got a similar story to that. In um, I spent some time. I spent a few months in Malawi a few years ago working in an HIV malaria clinic. The, the word went around the village one evening. They wanted to they wanted to slaughter a goat, but they couldn't work it out. And that because there's no waste associated with this, you know, this is all done with a lot of respect and a lot of care. Nothing is to go to waste. And I had a knock on my, my door one day and they said, uh, Mike, we're thinking of, of slaughtering a goat. Would you like the hind leg? <laughs> because they've got no interest in the hind leg. But of course, as, as, a, as a typical Brit, um, whether it be leg of lamb or, or or leg of goat, I'm going to do something with with the leg. So I agreed to buy the uh, the leg of the goat or the hind leg of the goat, and the the goat was duly dispatched. Wow! wow. So nothing nothing goes to waste. Nothing. What about the other leg? Sorry. What about the other hind leg? Um, I can't remember. I think I think one of my colleagues bought that. It wasn't a three legged goat then. No, it wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> So did you do something good with it, Mike? What did you do? I I roasted it, and then the I think I, I, a couple of the nurses had some some roast goat, and then uh, what was left was chunked and curried. Mm. So, yeah, I love I love curried goat. Yeah, one of my favourite curries. It's just it lends itself so well to Jamaican curried goat. Wonderful. My my, my father was was in the army and. Um, he was uh, he was in Saudi Arabia quite quite a lot in the army, and and he he developed this huge love of curries, which he imparted to us at a young age. And I now make curries you know, three or four times a week. But I remember at junior school, the only time I ever got into trouble at, at, at school <clears throat> was um, when we were asked our favourite meals, and you know. Samantha was asked, what's your favourite meal? Oh, oh, um, my my mummy does uh, this wonderful paella because we're we're Spanish. Okay, lovely. Julian, what about you? My favourite meal is a fuck up in a frying pan. (laughs) Officer Mr. Ryle, officer, you go Mr. Ryle. I I didn't know it was a swear, but my father used to make these amazing curries and call them a fuck up in a frying pan. I thought, what's wrong with that? What's wrong with that? Well, it's interesting about the use of swear words. I remember a neighbour, um, military neighbour, or uh, Armistice's wife, uh, one of the little companies, and uh, she realised that she had to modify her language a little bit when there was this little voice from the back of the car saying, Mummy? Yes, dear? There aren't many knobheads on the road today, are there? <laughs> 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 Oh, oh dear. It's, it's, it's a shame to mention this. In, in, in. Well, the parrots just started whistling. Yeah, so. I wonder where it was. I thought there was some sensor coming in. Ask them in. Yeah. Ask them in. Let's, let's chat to the parrots as well. Why not? He's called Archie. He's called Archie, and he's a rescue from work. And for a long time, he was in my office while all of the machinations of whether the owner could have him back or what have you. Were, were ongoing and he does talk a lot so he sings you're my sunshine and um do a little dance make a little love and all of this and he also does a good ray winston impression does he so he, he sits there and goes shut up you slag i'm the daddy now i'm the daddy now <laughs> that's where that is Okay. Oh, right. right, he does do that too. But um, he, he imitates me quite a lot. And I, I also mm-hmm. taught him to do to whistle the the whistle version of the signature to the Simpsons. Yeah. 
But the, <laughs> the trouble is, at work, he's in the room next door to where occasionally animals that are collapsed or crashing or being put to sleep are. Right. And he's got no filter. No, no, he, he wouldn't. And as soon as you're on the phone, he answers the phone for you and stuff like that. <laughs> and at the moment, he's mostly whistling and looking at us. But uh, okay, so the phone rings. It goes, "Hello, hello." <laughs> and, uh, and if you put your cow on, you say, "Won't be long." Yeah. He's very bright. He's very situational. So uh, if I'm uh, the other dog in here is uh, is a pro, is a young black Labrador, and if he's and I'm trying trying to get him to get down or stop doing something like that, Archie will go sit. Yeah. Really? yeah, and yeah. he also he both dogs have a different whistle. Yeah, and he bows whistle. He doesn't do dolly songs. because he doesn't hear it really. But uh, she's older. She's an older girl, so mm -hmm. she's a, a bit better these days. My sister used to have a, a, a an Amazon blue fronted Amazon. Mm. Uh, oh, so they, they talk amazingly, and he would do a perfect impression of the doorbell. Mm. Which would invariably make my dog bark, and then Charlie would go. <laughs> so my favourite one. We used to have board a parrot at one of my previous jobs, and it would be in the prep room where we we're doing whatever, and it would mimic the dental drill. <laughs> and you suddenly go, <gasps> and you're like, "What? Whoa! What did I?" Just <laughs> Yeah. So well, that's after the long walk, because if you go in first thing in the morning, first time he sees you, is the flat battery sign of flat flat battery of, of a smoke alarm. Mm. And if I put him in the car, and he comes in the car with me when if I take him to work or what have you, he does the reversing beep. So it's <laughs> a backwards reversing beep. It's a backwards side reversing beep, and he'll do that all the way down the motorway. He's really looking quite excited. He's hearing this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> My client's claims that her parrot ordered a thousand pounds worth of stuff from Amazon via her Alexa machine. Yeah. I don't know how true it is, but it's a great story. I, I, I can see how she's doing that. Don't let. Don't yeah. your Alexa set yeah. up. Leave Alexa. <laughs> 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 Apart from the parrot, Molly, what else have you got in there? Did I hear a lion then? That, that was the other dog. He was That's a bit right. grumbly. He thought he could hear somebody outside. And he's, he's just um, exercising his right to... Yeah, he's an 18-month-old black lab. Oh, bless yeah. him. Oh, bless. So he's he all, grr, grr, yeah. I'll get you, grr. Ooh, 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 ooh. <laughs> he's very soft. He's called Bo. Yeah. Bo. Bo. Oh, bless him. Bo. No, B-O. He's named after a... Um, I named her after it's a... Um, a tribe in a district in Sierra Leone. Oh right, right. Not not Bo Diddley, the um, blues player. No. Or short for Ebola. It's not that. No. <laughs> <laughs> We've also got the two two baby dragons. Yes. Ah yes. Now what what uh, what sort of ages are they? I've got no idea because they're rescue ones. So they were dumped in the winter in St Helens in Merseyside oh. and they have lost bits of themselves due to frostbite. They're almost two bearded dragons. So yeah, the better part of two bearded dragons. Right. Are, are all your pets rehomed? Because as, uh, as a pet, most my, pets have rehomed. Yeah. Bo wasn't. Bo, Bo was, was, a, was, a, was a purchase and... That, oh. that was a sudden message on Easter <laughs> Sunday. Um, oops. Look what I've done. <laughs> so I, I had a previous black Labrador who um, actually she and I did feature on a bike on these for you guys, remember? Um, that's well, it's a, well, the problem with how they use a picture of a German Shepherd dog and yeah. call them male. Oh, yeah. But the, the, um, she was one of our um, ID detection dogs yeah. uh, who was called Fire and was blown up in Afghanistan in uh, in um, a few years ago, yeah. and quite badly injured, but didn't lose anything. And I wasn't convinced what her long-term future was going to be. I took her, I, I took her on, and actually, she did really, really well. And she, she was an abs amazing absolute girl. character, absolute character. And uh, and and I was at a, when I was asked to be a president, I was at a kennel club event at uh, Earl's Court, and I met a guy who was the 
chief executive of the Wall Foundation. And he said, Oh, I think Bill and I might be interested in that. He dropped me an email. I never did. But a few months later, I got a call from a colonel on the board saying, We want your dog. And he was, so he, she was the mascot for the first, um, for the Olympics Games for the GP team. Right. And, um, and we got interviewed by Claire Balding live during the opening, during the opening ceremony. Hello. I didn't say, say an awful lot. But so, I really like the microphone, though. Yes. Oh, well, that was a different <laughs> one when she yeah. took out a microphone. Um, but she, um, but sadly, she was diagnosed um, two, three years ago with um, um, disseminated histocytic sarcoma. Uh, yeah. No. Um, and do you know what? It was textbook. I think the, the woman sort of depends to pay for surgery last 128 days, and I think she asked 135. Yeah. Um, and, and so when she died, it was, I was, I, you know, it was difficult. It was difficult. And I saw, so I, this is, this is building up to the tortoises. So I decided I wanted pets that were, hopefully, unless you mess up their brumation, they weren't going to die on you. So, um, I bought, I was going to buy one tortoise, but the tortoise lady, who, which is her handle, sold them to me, so I'm going to have two tortoises. So, and they're called Earth and Wind. Good. And and the fire is missing, of course. Yes. And bizarrely, Wind, and I hadn't even realised my name, and when you bend that, when you approach Wind, he hisses at you, and Earth likes to dig into the ground. Oh, mm-hmm. um, that's interesting. Um, appropriately named, man. Yeah. Those are those two. But then since then, we've acquired a, what's, what's what, Fred, what species, Fred? Fred's a great tortoise. So Fred is a... Just a Testudo Greco. So Fred's very old. He's old as I am. He's what, 84? No, I think he's 51. I can't remember. Yeah. Yeah. He's so Fred, as old as me then. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so oh, he's, now the, he's now the oldest uh, vertebrate in the, in the household. Yeah. Um, and we've also acquired, which is a stray from a charity. Uh, Alfred. Alfred, who's, Alfred, who's, who's a evil bugger. Who's yeah. a bastard horse filled tortoise. <laughs> they, they, they can be really aggressive. If yeah, anybody would is. like a horse field, yeah. yes. When, when, when you feed, when you put food in, he attacks Fred. He doesn't eat, but he attacks. And yeah. Fred is ten times the weight. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes you win, though, Fred is sitting on Alfred, which I can yeah. completely understand why. My, my wife always wanted a tortoise, and so f- seven years ago I, I, I got a one, a uh, little Herman's tortoise, about, um, about that sort of size. Mm-hmm. And about six months later... Uh, one of my clients handed in this tortoise that had been found straying in the high street, about the same sort of age, similar Hermans, but that it had um, shell rot. And so um, we couldn't, um, we, we, I, I treated, the, treated the shell rot, but we can't, we can't safely hibernate him because mm-hmm. there's, there's this risk of the shell rot uh, recurring. And so we, we, we keep him, uh, awake all year round and, and to stop them both arguing because they get on so well we keep them both awake mm-hmm. uh, and, and they're doing fine but the, the the point of this was the first one my wife had always wanted a tortoise called grammaticus uh, mm-hmm. she read a, a book when she was very young in which someone had a tortoise called grammaticus so we we, we got this tortoise and it was duly mm-hmm. called grammaticus then we acquired another one and so we, we pondered for about half an hour thinking what what to call it what to call it and of course the only name we could come up with was Arithmeticus. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So now we need a legibus. Yes. We, we've got the full set. I wonder whether now would be a good time to segue into, um, Mike and I have come up with this, this little thing called 60 Second CPD. W- would you be willing to take on the challenge? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, mine's actually going to be on CPD. Okay, so... so- this is this is fun. I'm really excited about this. Really? So, Neil Smith, sixty second CPD on CPD. Your time starts now. So there are a lot of myths about CPD. People get very concerned uh, about how they're going to achieve their CPD, particularly this year when there haven't been any conferences. And the thing I want to say is, you really need to look about what CPD is. CPD is continuing professional development. It's just things where you are learning, which are relevant to the job that you do. So people forget that, for example, mentoring a vet student, discussing a case with a, with a colleague, or um, as well as doing webinars and conferences, all count as CPD. But the other thing I want to mention is the RCVS's One CPD app, 
uh, where you can record CPD, which is actually going to be the mandatory um, platform for recording CPD from next year, from year up in 2022. But it's really easy to use, easy to download, uh, give it a go, and actually you might learn a lot more about what CPD is rather than just going to conferences. And that's exactly 60 seconds. Wow. Very nice. So picking up on what you've just said there, um, you can't stop it, can you, Mike? No, I can't stop it again. I've, 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 I've got to try and... <laughs> That's all of us got another minute CPD that we then have to note on our one CPD app and also bloody reflect upon. I'm not sure whether you can record minutes of it. Uh, we're, we're, ah. we're, ahead, we're ahead of you here, yeah, Molly. Yeah. Well, we've been looking at the rules that have been put out about this CPD and, and obviously we, we feel that we, we provide a good service, don't we, Julian? I think we do. I, I think actually, from what you're saying, that that, that really means that tonight ha- has been CPD. Brilliant. I've got another hour and a half that I have to then record and reflect upon. I think I think elements of it could be if it's mm. relevant to one's practice. Mm-hmm. So I once had one of my officers uh, want to go on a canine, uh, sorry, a feline intensive care course. And had to point out that, bearing in mind that we don't have any cats in the army, um, that <laughs> that wasn't that wasn't relevant. <laughs> and actually, from asking this point of view, it's not relevant to your job. That is, but for example, if part of your work requires an hours um, diversity inclusivity training, that's CPD. Yeah. Um, if it's the fire training, that's CPD. Um, so there's 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 I, it, it does concern me that people get. Wound up and angry about how on earth am I going to do this five hours? You know, I can't afford, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There's so much that you can do. There, um, there is. I think people are so out there. used to the idea of didactic learning, mm. uh, which is information that goes from the uh, f- from the mouth of the lecturer to the pen of the student and doesn't bypass the brain of, of either, mm. or doesn't pass through the brain of either rather. Yeah. Uh, Mm-hmm. But you're absolutely right. It's a continued professional development. Professional development. We we need to uh, to, to broaden and extend our veterinary horizons in whatever field we work. It, it, and the reflection piece is quite interesting. It's something that um, we, we, that. we yeah. may have a we we have discussions about on occasions. Mm. But you know, I've done in the past. You know, I recorded something I've done on CP. You know, something I went to. I went to a lecture at BCM and such and such. And my reflection is, I didn't learn anything new. This was a complete waste of time. Um, oh, that's a good reflection. So that is, th- this is a clear green light that viewers and listeners to Veterinary Ramblings, and you can download it on Spotify and iTunes or watch mm. it on Facebook, is clearly CPD. It's but good I, to CPD. We, I would say is actually if you're, if this is the portal for reflecting on how you do your job, then that's CPD. It doesn't mean that necessarily we've discussed GDVs and how to deal with them. We haven't discussed management of RTAs or the respiratory cat. But actually, if it makes anybody reflect upon their job, then... Oh, Molly, are you, do you fancy doing a 60-second CPD? Sure. You're up for that, yeah? Mm-hmm. Let, let me see if we can get the... I'll see if we can get the clock working <laughs> again. <laughs> you can just count down from 60 if you want to, Mike. That would be the other way of doing it. Here we go. Here we go. And what are you going to do your CPD on, Molly? So I want to talk about transferable skills. Transferable skills. Okay, then transferable skills starting now. So as vets, we all learn how to examine and diagnose a variety of species. So when you come into the clinic and you have an animal presented to you that you are not familiar with, don't lose your skill. Use your transferable skills to do a good clinical examination. And most of my job as a referral clinician is actually completing a very good and very basic clinical examination. I use my transferable skills. I haven't necessarily seen a macaque before, but I do know how to sculpt a heart and I know how to check its lungs. I know how to get a good baseline. And when all of our lecturers have mentioned to us when we start learning how to be clinical vets, get a good 
clinical database, just do it. Just get a blood sample, do an x-ray and do a good clinical exam. You can do it. Wow. wow, Dean, absolutely perfect. Right, I'm, I'm that's, that's, that's I quite, think that's having quite... the going down really helps. With I'm, that. I'm going to have to go and try and turn this thing off again. Hang on. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, that's brilliant, Molly. And and actually, it is. It's something I say to to my um, my new vets uh, whenever they're seeing a, a different species. We we, we don't see a lot of exotics. We see we see a few, and and they say, well, what, what am I going to do? And I say, well, the first thing you're going to do is examine it. Yeah. You, you say you, you yeah. say what you're going to do in 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 terms of have I got a diagnosis? No, you haven't got a diagnosis because you haven't no. even seen it yet. And it, it might be quite obvious. If it comes yeah. with a foot hanging off, then the diagnosis is it's got a foot hanging off. Examine yeah. it. Examination. You may not know the relevant clinical parameters, but they can be looked up. You do know, exactly. as you say, Brother Oscar, how to take a temperature, how to look at a mucous membrane, how to mm -hmm feel an abdomen how to feel for asymmetry and it's all of those things isn't it absolutely and i always say when i'm teaching students i say to them it doesn't matter when you get the knowledge it's just that you know a where to find it and that you need it mm. yes. so you can, it doesn't matter as long as your receptionist have told you what species you've got or you're smart enough to ask the owner before the box gets opened Yep. yep. Then you can go and look stuff up once you've got to the point, you know, and if you can't do a TPR because it's the reptile, you need to know, actually, you need to know the temperature and everything else externally. And it, it is just that shift in the paradigms. Yeah, I, th I think I think we, sh we share that, Molly, don't we, that um, I'm, I'm very, very keen on just doing basics right. Yeah, Getting basic, absolutely. Simple stuff right. And you, you can then dance a tune later. I, I think I think we, we, we need now to, to reflect on our CPD, don't we? Oh, okay. So what have we got here tonight then, Julian? So, well, so I custom make the, the certificates, and, and obviously I've put certificate twice because we've got double CPDs. <laughs> and, it, and it says, once again, we've pulled off an impossible task before breakfast. That's breakfast tomorrow, obviously. Doubling up on CPD because twice the chat is twice the fun. Thanks for your attention. And so there's the little veterinary ramblings logo there. there there's a there's a cat practicing yoga. Brilliant, good. And, and, and reflecting there there is a uh, a little wild turtle being rehabilitated into oh, well, captive for uh, hatched rather. Um, and and these I think are just a reflection of of the distance we have to go still the length we have to go. To, to tell our clients just to breed sensibly for heaven's sake. Yes. So here's a cat, here's a dog, both with the same problems, but they have micro nostrils, micro nasal openings. Uh, and both of these dogs could, couldn't actually breathe mm -hmm. enough to be able to oxygenate themselves. Uh, simply operating and opening their nostrils gave them back a quality of life that we shouldn't have had to do. We shouldn't have had to go to the extent of having these pets bred with such deformities, so that they all need surgery. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and just reminding us that it's Christmas. Look, I, I was having a chat to Rudolph the other day, and, and he agreed. Uh, so you, you, you do know this is going to go out in February, don't you? I know, but it, every day is Christmas, if you truly believe, Mike. Father <laughs> well, Christmas you, doesn't actually take a day off. Do also the male, re male reindeer shed their antlers, apparently, during the winter. It's the females that keep running through. Is that right? Mm -hmm. I don't know, I read it on Facebook, so it must yeah. be true. It must be right. It must be right. <laughs> I, I know a thousand facts about reindeer that I've never bothered to check. <laughs> <laughs> what, through reading Facebook? Absolutely. Yeah. But, but we, should, we should reflect on, on, uh, on the information we've, we've actually got well, tonight. We, we should, because you, you mentioned it there, Motley, and, and obviously mm. reflection is, is a key part of, of CPD, reflecting on... Mm -hmm. Some of the things that we, we have learned. So could, could we invite you both to join us in a moment's reflection on the CPD that you've so generously shared with us? Yeah. Oh, 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 how, how, how are we doing this, Molly? I'm going to in, invoke the mudra here. Yeah, no, right. I think actually reflecting 
as a group is an amazing idea. And I think that's much better than writing it down on an app. <laughs> we, are, we, we agree, Molly. Absolutely. Yeah. Please, please join us in a moment's reflection. A moment's reflection. On our mm -hmm. CPD today. No, I've actually got mood music in the background here. Yeah. <laughs> I think things are joining us in the in the reflection, though. And actually, it, we 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 do always have a bit of a laugh about that. I, I guess uh, what you're saying, though, but both of you uh, tonight was uh, reflection isn't necessarily sitting down and writing a huge essay about. No, what no, no I, would, I would I would agree on that. It's, um, it's not. It, it's it's a, reflection is a take home message. It can be more. It can be a huge exercise, but otherwise it can just be a take home message. Have I learned anything? Haven't I learned anything? And I remember um, a lecturer I went to shortly after qualifying, uh, this, this uh, great American lecturer who, who was unfortunately a bit patronizing in his tone. And it, it was on the gastrointestinal tract uh, problems, or, 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 as, or as he said, as an American, gastrointestinal. Mm. And after a while, he stopped saying the full gastrointestinal and started saying, so GIT problems are, are, uh, can be very profound problems that you see in your practice. And he, he said this, and he said, oh, by the way, I should say, GIT is our abbreviation for gastrointestinal tract. And this chap <laughs> sitting next to me said, that's funny, because GIT is our abbreviation for American. <laughs> that's, yeah, yeah. <laughs> And to all of our American listeners, that's, that's <laughs> called irony. Yes. Absolutely. Good luck with that. <laughs> well, <laughs> there you go, the viewers. Well, I, think, I think there are people who feel that reflection is about writing everything, your inner thoughts and, and everything about, about things. And, and that's not, that is certainly not what I think. I think it's about, to me, it's about teasing out the key, <laughs> key, key, key points that you found, which could be feelings as well as actual facts, mm. but it's not about regurgitating um, the, the, the CPD you just experienced. But I think actually the more effect, I think it, they, they put it in there because it's a proven sort of ballast to your learning, if you like. But quite often the better way of doing that is actually sort of discussing it with your colleagues, talking yeah. about Absolutely. So a veterinary club, a journal club, or, or which a case discussion. That's very interesting. If you look at GPs, CPD requirements, which is 50 hours a year, half of their learning has to be with others. Is that right? So, because I, I, one of my concerns is, is people doing what I really refer to as dead webinars, mm -hmm. um, where they just turn it on, and there is there are no questions and no MCQ in there. There's no, and you, you know, how even you know, how do you know you've actually got anything out of that at all? Yeah. We, yeah. we give them a certificate. I think it's hard because on the flip side of trying to provide that kind of content sure. for most of us who are not teachers, that's really really hard to provide suitable and appropriate content to do that. It is, but if you can watch yeah. it with somebody else, or have both of you watch it and then talk about it after. Actually, you can double your CPD hours because you can have that bit in a CPD, as yeah, as well, and you will actually get a lot more out of it. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And so, yeah. it's not actually that difficult to achieve the CPD requirements, uh, no. and, and and frankly, it's fun. I, I I've never I, I've never not wanted to learn. I've never not wanted to to improve and to yeah. be able to in, in, increase the offering I can give to to clients because actually, I love the job I'm doing. And I love to do it as well as I can. And I know that the, 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 the three of you do too, which is why, uh, why you're here doing this, why you're actually engaging in, in veterinary ramblings. But yeah, I, I, think, um, I think people do get very wound up about, about having to do CPD without thinking, actually, I enjoy doing it and I do yeah. it anyway. So. Yeah. So Julian, can you can you lighten the mood on CPD somehow? Can you? Uh, I've got a joke. joke tonight. I've got a joke. Have you? Yeah, I thought of this joke. Um, 
it was something you mentioned, Neil, because uh, you're a Yorkshireman, and um, and you said e a few times, and and, and so th this this reminds me <laughs> about the Yorkshireman whose wife. <laughs> I've got ferret down my trousers. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, I don't want to hear that. We're on. We're on. It's okay. Yes, yeah, all right. We'll cut that bit. We're on Zoom. No one's wearing trousers, Neil. <laughs> <laughs> so there was this Yorkshire businessman whose wife died, and he went to the stonemasons and he said, uh, he said, you know, she was always a very, a very spiritual lady, always very spiritual, and so I know that she'd like a a, a nice headstone. And I want I wanted to say, she were thine, O oh Lord. I don't want it wild Tuesday week if you could for the interment. So uh, the same he says, yeah, I'll, I'll do that for you, no problem at all. And he came back the following week to see how it was going on. And uh, he looked at it, he said, no, you spelt it wrong. He said, I, I can't have that. She were thin, O oh Lord. You missed the E out. What on earth are you talking about? Oh, goodness, she were thin, O oh Lord. Terrible stuff. I can't have that. So much, I'll tell you, sorry, I missed out. This is my mistake. I'll, I'll, I'll fit it in, no problem at all. Be ready for the funeral. So um, they, they they have the uh, the ceremony and it goes very well. And they, they drift outside to, uh, to, to, the, to the grave side where the coffin is then lowered. And they bow their heads in prayer. And the businessman looks up and looks at the headstone and it says, E, she were thin, oh Lord. <laughs> I don't know. Well, as, as you may know, I went to uh, I went to college in Sheffield. Yeah, and uh, I, I met a lot of nice characters there. And uh, one day, I, I met a dyslexic Yorkshireman. He had a cat flap on his head. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can always tell a Yorkshireman, but you can't tell him much. <laughs> 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 You're the vaccine now, you live in Lancashire. Oh, my word. <laughs> oh, dear. How do you cope with that, Anil? <laughs> I keep taking the medicine. <laughs> <laughs> Both Molly Barger and, and Neil Smith, thank you so much. Molly Barger Smith, as you like. Yeah. No, it's, it's been fabulous having you here on Veterinary Ramblings. And if, if you have liked what you've heard or seen today, on the, this episode of Veterinary Ramblings, don't forget to click like and obviously share it to your friends who think may benefit or enjoy what we put together. Neil, Molly, thank you so much for joining us on Veterinary Ramblings. Thanks for inviting us. It's been a fabulous evening. Really Raise good. a glass and may your dog go with you. <laughs> may your dog go with you. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs>